pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you, Lord, for all the good things that you have done, you are doing, and you are going to do. And we give you glory in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. As you know, as a church, we're going through a, a series called Jesus Said and looking at different things that Jesus said um, and, and just looking around the context and understanding what Jesus was really bringing with those things that he said to us. And today, we're going to have a look at the authority of Jesus. Mark chapter 9, Matthew, sorry, chapter 9, verse, uh, verses 4 to 5 says this. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? Now, this is a statement about authority. What Jesus is saying is, I have the authority to do both. I have the authority to forgive sins, and I have the authority to heal, to say to someone, rise and walk. And today we're going to look at some different types of authority that Jesus carried, and how people responded to it, and the different things he did that he showed to show that he had the authority, different forms of authority that he demonstrated. Now, the Gospel of Matthew, which is where we're going to be looking in today, it brings out a lot about the authority of Jesus. Each of the Gospels is written um, from the perspective of the writer. We know that they're Holy Spirit inspired, but each one of the writers had their own mindset and they had their own audience that they figured they were speaking to or writing to. Everyone had a different audience in mind. So when we read the Gospels, we're getting four different perspectives of the life of Jesus. And you see different emphases in them, different emphases, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, Matthew himself was a Jew. He was Jewish. And he was writing to a Jewish mindset. So he talks a lot about Jesus' authority because this mattered in the Jewish mindset. What mattered is, I will listen to you if I know that you have the authority to speak. If you don't have the authority to speak, I'm not interested in what you have to say. So Matthew wants to speak to Jewish people that Jesus is their Messiah. Jesus is the saviour of the world. But he's very big on, you must understand, he has the authority to speak as your Messiah. You have to understand his authority, otherwise they would not accept Jesus as their Messiah. Mark is written more to like a Roman mindset. So Mark often brings a whole picture with a lot of detail uh, where Matthew will talk about, oh, Jesus did this and not give all the details of a story. Mark will give you the details of the story because the Roman mindset was much more action-oriented. What did people actually do? So he would tell the whole story and he'd tell it in its fullness. Luke is written more like a Greek mindset or to Gentiles. Sometimes uh, people who weren't Jewish were called the Greeks or the Gentiles. And it's written in a way that is for people that because um, the Greeks really valued thinking and they really valued the way people, you know, thought through things. And so Luke is a little bit more in that, that vein. And John is different from the other three. It's called a didactic gospel because John really just talks about uh, Jesus' divinity. John's focus is the divinity of Jesus. Please understand Jesus is divine. And in fact, a lot of the commentators say that John was speaking to a group of people uh, to a heresy that had begun amongst a group of people in a church where they were saying Jesus didn't really exist before he was born to Mary. So if you think about the foundation verse of the book of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Because John, his foundation statement to people who were saying, Jesus didn't exist before he was born on earth, his foundation statement says, when God was, Jesus was, because Jesus is God. And his thing is teaching about that Jesus is God. But we're looking at Matthew today. And so Matthew brings out a lot about Jesus' authority. So a few types of authority that Matthew is bringing out for us to understand and for, for the people reading at that time to understand. First one is the authority of his birth. Now, if the, the Jewish people were looking for their Messiah, his birth was very, very important. So right at the start of his gospel, Matthew establishes that Jesus is born of the line that was required for the Messiah. Verse, chapter 1, verse 1 says he is the son of David and he is the son of Abraham. 
the son of David, the son of Abraham. Like John had a founding verse, a, a founding statement to his gospel, Matthew's founding initial straight out there statement is, he is the son of David, he is the son of Abraham. Because the Messiah had to come from the line of David and had to come from Abraham, meaning the Messiah was Jewish. Now, uh, the son of Jesus, Jesus is not the son of David literally, and I mean literally the way it's meant to be used. And David was not the son of Abraham literally. We know that. Generations. There's Abraham, there's generations. But what it's talking about is the line. In the Jewish line, that's why often in the Bible you see the begat, 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 because it matters. It mattered what line you came from. If you were declaring, I am the Messiah, I am your Messiah, it had to be stated you came from the line of David and you were Jewish, you came from Abraham. Luke's gospel, because you know Matthew starts with a genealogy because that's what mattered, Luke's gospel's genealogy takes it back to Adam because Luke's was written to everybody. It includes the Gentiles. It was particularly written for Gentiles to understand Jesus and what Jesus was doing. So he goes straight back to Adam because when you go straight back to Adam, we're all included. We're all included when you go back to Adam. Now, all the Gospels are relevant for everyone. I don't want to give the wrong opinion, wrong idea. So don't go ripping Matthew out of your Bible like, well, don't need that, I'm a Gentile. All the Gospels matter to all of us. And there is, it's all the perspectives of the life of Jesus. But I think it can be important to understand the different emphases that we see in them as you read. And Matthew wants us to understand Jesus wasn't just a prophet. They had prophets. The people he's talking to had prophets. They were used to prophets. And he wasn't just a teacher. They had a lot of teachers. And there were teachers saying this, saying that they were listening to scribes and listening to the teachers. And Matthew is at pains to say he's not just a prophet. He's not just a teacher. He is the son of God. And bit by bit, Matthew begins to show who he really was. And firstly, he had to show that he had the authority of birth. Secondly was the authority of speech, an authority of speech that Jesus demonstrated. Chapters 5 to 7 in Matthew are known as the Sermon on the Mount. We, we all refer to them as the Sermon on the Mount. And it's interesting because the Sermon on the Mount often is seen by people as this thing where Jesus is like really lovely and telling us all to live a nice life and be good to people and let's all get along and let's all be nice. There's a view of the Sermon of the Mount and maybe it's because the word beatitude sounds like beautiful, I don't know, but it seems to me like the Sermon on the Mount is looked at as a time when Jesus stopped and said some nice things about how we should do life. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the pure in heart. And people think, isn't Jesus lovely? Isn't he lovely? Blessed are the pure in heart. But in fact, I think what had ha was happened is for many people who don't know Jesus, he has start, they think he looks weak. I saw this thing that said, the meek shall inherit the earth, but they'll be too meek to take it. Because out in the world, a lot of people view Jesus as someone who was very weak. You know, Jesus meek and mild. That's how people talk about him. But if you read actually um, through these chapters, chapters 5 to 7, you are not reading sappy sweetness from a, from a meek and weak guy. What you are reading is statements of authority that come from someone who is speaking as God. He is speaking as God. The Sermon on the Mount ends in chapter 7 by saying this. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as one of their scribes. So what does it mean that Jesus taught with authority? Was there something in his tone? When I was young, that's what I used to think. They were astonished at authority and I would think, what was his tone? How was, what was the tone that they were all like, wow, who talks like that? Was it that? No. Was it that he used big words? No. What was it? He spoke as God. He had the authority of being God. He was man, and he even refers to himself there as son of man. In this passage, when we go to, it, go to more of it later, he doesn't call himself son of God. He says, I have this authority, and then he says, the son of man has this authority. Now, Jesus was called the son of God because he was fully God. He's called the son of man because he's fully man. But in this passage, he says to them, son of man, because 
God came to earth to be a man. So he wants to say to them, I am one of you, but I am God. So Matthew is bringing out this understanding that, yeah, Jesus walked around on earth with us, but he's not just one of your prophets. He's not just one of your teachers. He is actually the son of God with all the authority that comes with being that. See, they were used to hearing scribes and the way the scribes used to teach, they would um, learn from each other as we do. We, we learn from each other. They would hear different things and they would build their teachings on what they learnt, what they heard from other people. So they were building teachings on things they learnt over time and putting their te- and then they would come and teach it. A bit like this, I've gone to the Bible. So I'm seeing things, but I might see something somewhere else and say, I, I read a commentator and he said this and I'm building a teaching from that. But what Jesus would do he would say, he would come and he would speak as himself. He didn't speak anybody else's philosophies. He didn't come and build on anything anyone else said. Jesus just spoke as God. So you think about the Sermon on the Mount. And he, he would say this, you have heard it said, but I say to you. You have heard it said, but I say to you. You have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He said, you have heard it said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, you actually need to deal with your lust. So when we think about the Sermon on the Mount, it's not weak, sappy sayings. It's actually a very strong, very strong statement about powerful things about how to live life. But Jesus didn't speak other people's philosophy and ideas. He came and he spoke with the authority of God. He placed his words on the same level as God's words. And that's why they were astonished. The third authority he displayed was the authority of position. In chapter 5, 17 in Matthew, Jesus says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Because Jesus said some radical things, even along the lines of, you know, you've heard it said, but I say this to you. There were some who were questioning his motives. Is he trying to abolish the law? Is he coming to try and start a new law? Is he coming to try and start a new religion? What's he doing saying all these things? He sounds like he's trying to abolish the law. He sounds like he's trying to abolish everything that we know from the prophets. But Jesus says, I've not come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. Here, Jesus is essentially saying to them, everything you understand about the prophets, everything you understand about the law, it's all in one person and you're looking at him right now. Jesus is saying, these guys have spent years, they've spent their lives learning the law, they've spent their lives learning what the prophets said. What is the law and the prophets? It is God's requirements and it is God's promises. God's requirements and God's promises. And Jesus says everything that God requires of you and everything that God has promised you, you're going to find it in me. I am fulfilling that. I am the fulfillment of that. That's why Jesus says, come follow me. That's why Jesus says that we are to take him as our Lord and Saviour because every promise of God is in him. Everything that God requires of you is in him. If there's anyone here or anyone online and you don't have Jesus as your saviour and you think, what, do, what, what would God do for me? What's the promises or whatever? Or what does God want from me? I want to say to you, come to Jesus. It's all in him. It is all found in him. And this is what he's saying. The law and the prophets, I'm not trying to abolish anything. I'm fulfilling them. What you have understood your whole lives, I'm here. Your Messiah has come. The fourth authority was the authority of power. I don't know if the authority of power is the same thing to say because authority is power. But anyway, that's just the way I've said it. In chapter 8 in Matthew, we see that Jesus showed his authority to heal. He cleansed the leper. He healed the centurion's servant without even having to go and touch him. Often you saw people were healed by Jesus because Jesus touched them or they touched him as in the case of that woman with the the issue of blood. They either touched Jesus or Jesus touched them. 
But with the centurion, Jesus just said, the centurion had so much faith. A Roman centurion had so much faith. Jesus was amazed at him, at his faith, and he said, your servant's healed. Your servant's healed, and he went home and found his servant healed. In this same chapter, we see that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And then he went out on that same night after he healed Peter's mother-in-law and healed many people. And then he cast out many demons. And then to top it all off, he calmed a storm. Jesus demonstrated that he had the authority of God because he had power over the natural world and power over the supernatural world. He cast out demons. No one could cast out demons unless they had some authority in the supernatural world. You remember some of the disciples were trying to cast out demons and came to Jesus and said, we can't, we're just not able to do this. You had to have authority in the supernatural world to cast out demons. And you have to have authority over the natural world to heal a body and to calm a storm. So Jesus was demonstrating that he has come. You're, they're standing there looking at him. They're looking at a man. And he says, I have authority in the natural world. And I have authority in the supernatural world. So he didn't say that. He demonstrated that. That is what he was showing them. The authority of power. And then the fifth one, he has the authority to forgive sins. Now we're going to come to the passage where we got the original reading. I read two verses to you at the start. And this is the passage, so we're going to get the full context of where we are with this. But this is the one where people got upset. Jesus had already demonstrated who he, who, that he had the authority of birth. Sorry, Matthew's demonstrated that he's had that. Jesus demonstrated his authority through the things he says and the Bible said they were amazed and they were astonished and they couldn't have been upset with him because they followed him. By this stage, he has masses and masses of people following him because in this story, they can't get to him. There are so many people, they cannot get to him so they have to come up with a better idea. So his authority of speech, people loved it. They loved what he was saying. They were following him because they loved He was, oh, they were astonished. They were amazed. The Bible tells us they could not believe the authority with which he spoke. So they kept following him. And then he was also demonstrating his power. When he demonstrated his power, when he healed people, of course they followed him. Of course they brought the sick to him. Of course they brought the sick and lame to him because he showed that he had this authority. But now he says something and they get offended and they don't like it. That's a bit too far, Jesus. We love that you heal. We love that you say great things. We love that you come from the line of David and from the line of Abraham and therefore we can accept you as one of us. We love that. But don't go this far. You've upset us now. So let's have a look at what gets said here. He's already showed all these authorities and here now they get upset so we're going to read the first three verses of Matthew 9 get the context of that scripture that we began with it says in getting into a boat he crossed over and came to his own city now this is Capernaum Jesus has come to C Capernaum we often think that Jesus own city is Nazareth yes he had lived in Nazareth but during the time of his three years of ministry on earth Jesus lived in Capernaum and it says he got in a boat and he crossed the city to his own city. He's come to Capernaum. Capernaum is on the banks of uh, the Sea of Galilee, whereas Nazareth is landlocked. So that also helps us know he didn't go to Nazareth. He went to Capernaum. Verse 2, And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Now this is one of those times, as I said, it's good to know the different focuses of the of the um, Gospels and the different ways they're written because Mark tells this story in its entirety. As I said, Mark loves detail. So he tells the story as it was. This is the story of the four guys who broke through the roof to get their friend to Jesus. This is the same story. This is the circumstance we're talking about. So we have here this crowd that is so big, these guys have their friend on what I imagine is like a stretcher and they're trying to get to Jesus so that Jesus can heal him. Why is the crowd so big? Because Jesus has been healing people. Jesus has been saying things that are blowing their minds. So they're trying, there's such a crowd they can't, so they end up pulling up the tiles of someone's roof. They get on the roof, they pull up all the tiles uh, to, so there's enough space to bring their friend out. This is that story. And that's why it can be good to know that this is where Jesus is saying these things. He was saying it in that moment. He's saying it in that moment. So that's why, whereas Matthew gives it 
He doesn't say anything about the roof. He doesn't say anything about them pulling the tiles up. Matthew's not worried about that because what Matthew wants to talk about is Jesus speaking out and demonstrating his authority in this circumstance. And it says, when Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith. Now, I stopped. When I was preparing this, I just stopped there. Whose faith brought this man healing? The faith of his four friends. Jesus responded to their faith. Are you praying for somebody who doesn't have faith? I am. I'm praying for a few somebodies who don't have faith. Don't stop praying for them. Jesus will respond to your faith. I had someone come to the front and pray this many years ago, so no one here. And, and so I came to pray for them. And they said to me, I just, I just think I can even have faith for this anymore. I, I don't think I've got faith for this. And I said, I've got faith for you. I've got faith for you. Let's pray. And so we prayed. And then I went home. And you know how you can second guess yourself? I thought, is that theologically sound even? I've got faith for you if you haven't got faith. And I thought, did I just do something really stupid with someone who wanted prayer? So I was always very glad to see this. Jesus will respond to your faith for someone else. So if you're praying, don't stop praying. Who cares what, whether they have faith? Don't worry what they're saying to you. Don't worry how much they're against what, you're, what, what you believe. They may actually be like completely disregarding you. You keep praying for people who don't have faith because God responds to the faith of those who pray and have faith. Amen? So continue to pray for those other people. So continuing, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Now, maybe this paralytic was just too ill or too despondent because of his circumstance to uh, have faith. Maybe that's what was going on. I don't know. But Jesus says to him, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, in other words, when the Bible says behold, it's saying, look at this, take note of this. Some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you uh, think evil thoughts in your heart? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and he went home. This brings out two things, I think. Well, probably a lot more things, but two things particularly that I noted. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Why were they so upset? Why were they happy so far with everything Jesus did? But in this moment, they're offended, they get upset. Why were they upset? Because only God can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. So now they're like, Jesus, you've gone a step too far. Now, on this one issue, I agree with them. Only God can forgive sins. Amen? So Matthew is saying, what is Jesus? If Jesus is saying, you're forgiven, your sins are forgiven... He is demonstrating, I am God. This is their offence, blaspheming, putting himself equal to God. These people have spent their lives offering sacrifices, going to temple, doing all this stuff to get over and over and over to get forgiveness for their sins. Were they really getting forgiveness for their sins? No, they're getting a covering for their sins because the sin, then they had to go back and do it again. They had to go back and do it again. Had to go back and do it again. The book of Hebrews says Jesus is our great high priest. Why? Because he once and for all was a sacrifice for our sins. And it's interesting because the Hebrews even says Jesus did the sacrifice and then he went and sat down. Why would he sit down? Because the job's finished. Because the job is done. I've done what needed to be done. I can now sit down. Jesus is the once and for all sacrifice for our sins. But they couldn't understand that. They couldn't understand that because all they understood was you keep doing this. You keep doing these offerings. You keep doing these sacrifices. You keep going back to the temple. And God, God will forgive you for now. God will forgive you for now. Till next time you need to come back. Aren't you glad? that no one can forgive sins but God and we can go directly to him because of Jesus. 
We don't have to go to any special person or special place. Jesus is ready to forgive our sins straight away. And once again, he's opening his eyes to people of who he is. And he says even clearly, oh, in case you don't get it, Jesus says, so you will know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Secondly, the thing that this brings out is that Jesus demonstrates priorities. He's showing priorities. This man is paralyzed. He's a paralytic. His friends in desperation, you can see how desperate his friends are because they come to bring him to Jesus to be healed. The crowd is so big, they can't get to Jesus. They don't go, let's try tomorrow. Or maybe someone else can do this. They go, what do we need to do to get this person to Jesus? They are desperate. This is desperate behavior. I don't know what the owners of the house thought when suddenly tiles are being pulled up off their roof and people are breaking through the ceiling of where Jesus was. But these guys are absolutely desperate for their friend to be healed. They finally get him to Jesus. He's in front of Jesus. Here's this paralytic guy. And Jesus says, take heart. Or in other words, cheer up. Your sins are forgiven. Now, it's amazing and wonderful that his sins were forgiven. But I wonder if his friends were a bit like, that's not what we came here for. The guy's paralyzed, Jesus. We didn't come to talk about sin. We came to get a healing. But Jesus didn't come just to heal bodies. Jesus came, first and foremost, to deal with sin. Jesus' main mission was to bridge the gap that had become between people and God to bridge that gap, and that gap had happened. Why? Because of sin. And so Jesus' mission was the dealing of sin. Because he was God, because he had the power, because he was compassionate, yes, he healed bodies. Yes, he calmed demons, uh, cast out demons. <laughs> calmed demons, thank you, cast out demons. Yes, he did all those things. But Jesus' mission was about doing the once and for all sacrifice. Was he not going to heal this guy? He healed the guy. He was never not going to heal the guy, but he's demonstrating, his, he's demonstrating priority. What, is it important, more important for me to heal this man's body or his eternity? Is it more important that this man can get up and walk away or that he's right with God so that he is saved and can go and live in eternity with God? So Jesus is demonstrating his, um, his priorities. I just thought when I was reading that, these poor guys, I wonder what they thought Jesus was going to do. And then he says, cheer up, your sins are forgiven. And of course, then he goes on to heal him. So while the teachers of the law were outraged at what they saw as blasphemy, Jesus was once again stating, this is who I am. I am your Messiah. First and foremost, his mission on earth was to forgive sins. So number six, and this is the last one as we're drawing towards a close. We see we have, there is delegated authority. Delegated authority. Come with me to Matthew chapter 28 in your Bibles. Matthew 28. And we're reading at verse 18. It says this, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the, or to the, end of the age. Jesus demonstrated all that authority, and then after he died and rose again, and before he went to heaven, he passed his authority, that authority that he had established, he passed that authority to the apostles and to the church. So we now live in delegated authority. We live in delegated authority from Jesus. If, we, if Jesus had not done what he did, we would have no authority in any way over anything, especially like when we deal with the supernatural world. But Jesus had all that authority and now he has delegated it to the church. And he said... I have all this authority, You're, you belong to me, now you go and you do all this. We live in delegated authority. We live in a delegated authority of birth. 
because Galatians 3.26 says, in Jesus Christ, you are all children of God through faith. We have a delegated authority of speech. Matthew 18.18 18 says this, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We have delegated authority of position. 1 Peter 1.23 is one of my favourite scriptures. It says, you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And we have authority of power. The power Jesus demonstrated, he's given us this authority. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Samaria, and to the ends, in all Judea, sorry, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Only God can forgive sins. We don't have the authority to forgive sins. We have the authority and we have the empowerment to forgive each other, as Becky shared so well this morning. We have, we have an obligation, we have a responsibility to forgive each other things, but we cannot forgive sins. Only God can forgive sin to the point where a person's slate is made clean. But when we have Jesus... He has given us all of his authority for us to go about on the earth walking in his authority. Amen? Do you believe it? Yeah. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord. We're going to close with prayer this morning. I want to pray with you. And if anybody wants prayer, I'm going to ask you to just come forward. I want to say thank you to the people that have joined us online. We hope you come next week. And um, just go into this week. If you, if you have Jesus in your life, go into this week knowing that you walk in his authority. And if you don't, I really encourage you, ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, to forgive your sins. Thank you, Jesus. So.